a secret summer showcase shorts. Written and read by Matthew Elliott. 1. Charles the Courteous. Charles, sweetheart, your father and I have been talking, and we would like you to come home. I know these past few weeks have been difficult, but we don't like the idea of you being there by yourself. And now the treatment is finished, there's no reason for you to stay there. Come home, sweetheart. You'll be safe here, and not alone anymore. <laughs> you make one mistake, one little mistake, and suddenly you're dangerous. I mean, what the hell? I just went through a bad spell, that's all. Christ, I'm only human. What's the first lesson we learn? Forgiveness. Yet when it comes down to it, none of us are very forgiving. Even the ones that claim they are. And now, I'm expected to spend the rest of my life being re-educated. I had no idea what was going on, at all. My defence should have sp stood for itself, but no. One mistake. They say I have to work on my anger, control my mood swings. Wonder if they would have suggested that anyway if it was just because of the incident. What the hell does that even mean, control your mood swings? If I could control it, there wouldn't be a problem, would there? Come home, they said. My mother, I mean. Your father and I have been talking and we'd like you to come home. What the hell have they been talking about? And what are they hoping for? Jesus, I'm perfectly fine. The treatment was a success. The doctor even told me I had nothing to worry about. I just need to relax and take things slow. They don't understand. They never have. Sometimes I just black out. I don't know why. I can't explain it. I just lose moments. Certain moments I just can't account for. I wouldn't expect them to understand. They think I'm a failure. Yeah, that's why they want me to go home, so they can watch over me. In court they never spoke a word. I know they see my situation as unwanted reflection on themselves. Self-centered bastards. It's not always about them. What are they hoping for? Will they watch over me day and night? Maybe what if I have another moment? They're not safe. No one is with me around. The doctor says everything's okay. It was just an accident. The poor girl had just been unlucky. Moments I can't account for, but I saw them. I always see them. I'm just not in control. You know what I mean? I can see it. I live it. But I just I can't. I, I can't move my body when it happens. I just have no control over myself. I'm going home. I'm going to go home. We're going home. We're going home. It won't be that much farther. And they'll see. They'll know. It's not my fault. The poor girls are just unlucky. Unlucky. They will all be unlucky. 2. Departure You know, I can still remember sitting there in that dirty room. That first Tuesday. All those years ago. Mainly because I remember being terrified. Stepping into a room full of strangers. I can still remember the seat I took, forth from the front, because for the next few years <clears throat> I'd make sure nobody else took it. I was never tough or brave at school, but during those days that seat gave me hope for the future, because though I had friends sat in that seat, I knew I always would. 
still visit that hometown. And every time I do, it feels more like a tour. Because I can't travel through without the memories of what happened there. Each street tells a story that I remember everything. Playing Kirby until the sun went down, paper rounds in the snow, setting fire to the food department, prank call in the community centre, stealing each other's girlfriends, getting arrested, fighting at school, messing around on camera, the all-nighters, the parties, the drunken weekends, the fun, that life. past your old house today. I remember calling you every day. I remember that walk in the rain to the chip shop where that girl you liked worked, to the farm where I used to work, to the town centre where we made our first film, and the park where we made our last. I still have a pile of things that belong to you. In time I will return them, but for now they'll remain a reminder of that time. Until then, I'll always be sat in the fourth from the front, and in my mind you'll always be sitting in the fifth. Ten years later we've moved away and hardly speak anymore, but it's okay, because time changes nothing. And so, until we meet again, dear friend, I wish you luck, I wish you peace, and I wish you love, until the very end. Maybe one day, they'll remember us. 3. Insomnilance Dr. Brian Walthing leads us all down to stress. The inability to shut down, as he puts it, and that it's all in my mind, which it is. It's clearly all in my mind, it's not a physical entity. It would be easier if it was, of course, perhaps then I could punch it. My health has been deteriorating. How does he know this? I know he's taking the sleeplessness into account. But how can he tell it's deteriorating? Does that mean that my test results aren't improving? Or that the once so welcomed long evenings are slowly killing me? <sighs> Maybe I'm overthinking again. Christ, no wonder we played the stress card. It should go without question that I'm stressed. Anybody in my position would be. The world's longest day. So aggravating. You know what else is aggravating? Those Premier Inn adverts. That comedian. Those words. That rhyme scheme. Suggesting that the evening is much a wonderful, magical event. But it's not. Quite frankly, it's no more comfortable and easier to sleep at a Premier Inn. Yeah, I made the mistake. Oh, Ethel. You were so easily roped into this subliminal messaging. Promoting comfort, offering false hopes. The advert always made the towers look so comfortable. Towers, oh god, I need some sleep. Towers. In actuality, the towels could have been made from cardboard. They were stiff, unappealing. Since my trip, I've been advised again and again. Mr. Winsworth, you should check out cheap hotels and spa breaks to calm the soul or relax the soul. Something along those lines. Who comes up with this stuff? This whole advertising crap. Why do we fall for it? Oh, yeah. I can imagine you sat there quite adamant that you have never fallen for these tricks. But you have. Maybe not by Premier Inn. Bastards. But everybody. Everyday decisions. Formed from constant successful subliminal messaging. You call them instincts. <laughs> what a cute term. 
I'm sorry. It's unfair to be taking my aggression out on you, on them, on Premier Inn, or the comedian that promotes them. I'm just, just so tired. I hear people in the streets, in the cafes, in the parks, tell their acquaintances I've had a long day. I snort at these people, these ignorant individuals, oh God. The ignorant bastards who don't know the meaning of the word long. I suppose these people go home to a wonderful warm bed and wake up the next day claiming they're tired after a full nine hours sleep knackered and shattered two phrases I've recently come to understand ignorance these kinds these kind have never known what it's like to be knackered shattered or even tired I've recently become acquainted with Rosrum an oral medicine designed to promote healthy sleep to take 30 minutes before bed I've been on this for uh, more than two weeks now and uh, no success yet maybe it's me maybe I'm just one of these bionic men a superhero of some kind and the reason I can't sleep is because it's my duty to work through the evening protecting individuals innocent civilians from the evil that awaits in the shadows wish I'd thought of that earlier I could have written it down I'll only discard the thought tomorrow James uh, Abaniak which is, um, is a, kind of like a comedian I suppose he once made a comment on his podcast nothing about this time counts any life conclusions will be discarded in the morning, something like that. People who say, well, if you're up anyway, why not get some work done? And he says, and it doesn't work like that. And he's right. What James never emphasised during that podcast episode was that it's not impossible to work. It's impossible to think straight. I could easily occupy myself through the evening. I don't find myself lacking in motivation, I just find I can't concentrate. My mind, for lack of a better word, vanishes. And the later the evening gets, the more I become aware of how quiet it is in here and out there. I wonder do parallel universes exist, and if so, how many people or things are in this room with me right now? Even without a parallel universe, how many entities are in this room with me right now? My parents told me, of course, that when I was younger that the bully man didn't exist. They never comforted me about the possibility of ghosts, ghouls. It's silly to be scared of a monster that hides from you under the bed. But ghosts are able to drag you into the abyss. You will descend into a horrifying limbo. Where your flesh will rot, you will asphyxiate, and your soul will be forever tortured by forces beyond your control. Oof, oh God, what am I saying? I sound like one of those hateful preachers from garden fields. One church where God didn't exist, and if he did, the disgusting hate speak spat from Brethren Toothill would be cast away, along with him. How did my mind travel this far? Is this the stress? Why does my mind continue to race? Always looking for new information. And my eyes and body just want to sleep. I can find new information tomorrow. Please, just let me have now. Discard all thoughts. Wipe the slate clean after six years. I can't stand to take much more, quite frankly. Just allow me to rest. Slice my own goddamn throat if not for the fear that it would spite me. By the standards of my look, my death would mean eternal wakefulness, no sleep ever. Stranded in the afterlife, unable to rest, still fucking stressed, no doubt. Excuse my language, morbid thoughts. I just, I just want to sleep, I want to lie down in a warm bed, 
My head rested on a fluffy pillow made of feathers with the sound of the raging storm outside the window. Completely alone and quiet. Without these thoughts, without the stress, without insomnia. Just rest. That would be wonderful. Four. The other side of town. Meet Simon. He's 19 years old. Some say his best years are behind him, and no better days ahead of him. He splashes water in his face and slowly drives, staring vacantly into his reflection. His eyes look tired, but he's wearing party clothes. He's also attending a party, in case that wasn't obvious. No words are muttered, and all that can be heard is background noise. The character seems distracted. He checks his watch. 3.10am already? Last he knew it was 1am. He rubbed his forehead. He heads downstairs, checking out the party in a half assed way. He searches for the host to say goodbye. It's too late now. He wasn't even supposed to be at this party. Perhaps if he'd just set out now, he could be home for sunrise and he could just tell his mum that he'd felt uncomfortable at his friend's house. Yeah, good idea. He finds the host, thanks him for allowing him to tag along, and as he's about to leave, the host holds him up, offers him one last beer for the road. Simon takes the bottle and thanks him, and he leaves. He steps out onto the dark street, the 4am atmosphere surrounded by occasional orange lights highlighting the pathway. He was in Kirkby and Ashfield, somewhere near Kingsway. He knew that much. He opened the bottle and started walking along towards the bus stop. Why did he always let it get to this stage? He was behind on his rent, couldn't afford his food shopping, don't even get him started about the non-existent driving lessons. And yet, he could always find money for alcohol. He was fading. No money in his pocket, he wouldn't be able to face the new year. Was this all he wanted from life? No. It wasn't that easy to leave it behind. After all, this was him. He'd tried to ignore the urges and had tried to be something he wasn't. But after all is said and done, he wasn't as strong as he thought. He was a young man consumed by alcohol. His thoughts carried him slowly through the dark to the bus station, but as we all know it wasn't coming. Another drunken mistake, not anticipating the time he'd be leaving. After all the past times he'd swore to himself that he'd make that last bus, but never did. Now there was only one thing for it, he couldn't afford a taxi, he didn't have many friends who could accept his alcohol intake anymore. He wasn't that young man anymore. He'd have to make his own way home. Do you know how many individuals never make it home? Anything can be lurking around the corner, especially in these times. It's not safe outside, not anymore. As he leant against that bus stop, propping his head on his billboard, he heard a voice behind him. Let me guess, you missed the last bus. Simon turned around, to be greeted by a man giving him a calm smile. What's it to you? He asked abruptly. The man seemed to understand his hostility and took that as an answer. <laughs> I understand. What will you do now? Sam stared at him incredulously. Again, what have you got to do with you? Calmly, but defiantly. The man smiled. You know, that attitude won't get you anywhere. He looked around. Wow, it's been a while since you've been back here. I forgot how beautiful it- Can I help you with something, old man? Am I free to leave without taking this conversation any further? Simon asked, angrily. The man smiled. Old man? Well, well you'll be old one day. But of course, feel free to leave. In fact, if you set out now, you might be able to make it home before sunrise. Simon looked at him, then left without responding. What the hell was all that about? Simon muttered to himself. 
and when he was a safe distance away, he turned back to check the man wasn't following him. He wasn't. A little shake and he continues on through the town centre. He saw the statue of Harwood. Never saw the point. Sure, he was a famous man, but it had absolutely no effect on Kirby's heritage. Fucking arsehole, he muttered, passing it. The old man had tipped him. The alcohol still in his hand. He raised it to his mouth and took a swallow. How dare that guy try to talk to him. He didn't want to be spoken to. After all, had he asked to be spoken to? Continued on his route. He reaches the steps to the old train tracks. He checks his watch. It's almost five. The sun's coming up. The effect it had on the tracks was incredible. You know, you remind me of myself. I used to come down here when I was a kid. Said a deep voice somewhere behind him. He spun around to see another man, dressed in a parka coat, somewhere down the tracks. Who are you? Simon asked, keeping a safe distance in case he had to run. You know, this place hasn't changed at all. He looked around. Me and my friends used to hang around here, under the bridge. Simon tipped his head back, taking another drink of his bottle. Jesus, what is it with everybody recounting their life stories tonight? And for your information, everybody hangs out under the bridge, probably mistook a recent sighting for childhood memories. I know how you old people work with your mind, etc. Simon didn't care if he came across offensive now. In fact, he wanted to intimidate the man slightly. The man just chuckled. I used to have an attitude like that too. You're not so special, kid. You may be able to shoot off that mouth, but it's not going to get you anywhere. In fact, it's going to get you into a lot of trouble one day. Trust me, the man said with a glint in his eye, but with an odd wisdom. Simon again tipped his head back. It's a clear sign that he was getting angry. Look, I'm not quite sure why you're standing on the train tracks at five in the morning, but leave me alone, Simon said defiantly. I'm doing what you're doing. I'm just trying to find my way home, the man said. Simon looked on, then tried not to think too much. The alcohol was starting to take effect. He looked away and back at the man. Where do you live? Simon asked under his breath. Sutton, the man said. He seemed to understand the significance of this. Great, just my luck, Simon muttered to himself. Do you know the way? Of course, I may be old, but I still remember this route, the man said. Well, you were heading the wrong way, for one, Simon said with a hint of gloating in his voice. Oh, you must not know that route yet, the man said quietly. Simon stopped at this. What route? The path ends here. Yeah, the safe one. You'll learn it one day, the man said, and took lead leaving Simon stuck to the spot, outshone by the man. They both walked along the tracks. No train would pass. The track closed down a long time ago. How long has it been since this track's been out of service? Simon asked him. Uh, I remember reading it in the 40s. Before your time then? Simon asked sincerely. The man chuckled at this. You could say that, the man said. Those were my mother's days. It must have been nice. So peaceful. Simon had a glimpse of a smile. He took a swig of his bottle. You know, that's a fool's medicine, the man said, looking at the bottle. Yeah, good thing I'm a fool. The man stayed silent, but on seeing the pained expression on Simon's face, he spoke up. You went through a hard time at the moment. I know that expression. But don't worry. We all get them. Simon smiled. What's your name? Ben. You can call me Ben. The man said, smiling slightly. I'm Simon. I... Hello, Simon. The man said, still smiling slightly. They continued along the route, with Ben leading. Feels like hours, but alas, 
they had only been walking for about 30 minutes. But time can be a strange thing, especially when you need to be somewhere, or want to be somewhere. Along the path, Simon had overtaken Ben and was now leading. When he turned into the woods, he looked back to tell Ben the new direction. Ben was nowhere to be seen. Ben? Simon said gently, before shouting, Ben! No reply. Simon assumed that Ben must have gotten lost, but it was almost five, and he was still trying to sober up, so he continued on without him. As he passed down through the trees and woodland, he could see the sky lighting up slightly. It was almost dawn. This path was no problem for Simon. He'd played in these woods before as a child. He knew that there was a hill nearby, which he would have to pass to reach the housing estate. The hill towered over the housing estates that surrounded it. It was a fantastic sight. Ahead, he could see the exit from the woods and beyond the hill. It was almost 5.15 when he ascended up the hill. When he reached the top, he stood, admiring the scene. He heard a familiar voice. The view was always great from up here. Simon looked back. It was the man at the bus stop. What, what are you doing here? He asked. The man looked at him, calmly as before, and looked out over the estate. When I was younger, I'd come here to think, somehow. The way that the sun sat and rose always made me feel better. Simon looked confused. What do you mean? The calm man continued his gaze out to the horizon. No matter what bothered me, or what problems I faced, the sun still sat, and it would always rise again in the morning, and it taught me that no matter how bad things got, there'd always be tomorrow, and there'd always be a chance that any problem could be resolved, because life goes on. Simon looked at him. He didn't need to emphasise how important these words t were to him. And did they? The calm man looked at Simon curiously. Simon, not meeting his gaze, added, Did they always get better? The calm man smiled and looked back to the horizon. The sun was starting to rise. We meet many problems in life some harder than others. So long as you try your best and keep your head held high, there's nothing you can't achieve. Simon secretly smiled inside. These words had a profound effect on him. The two stood on the hill and watched the sunrise. It was 6.07 when Simon stepped onto his street. Still joined by the calm man, Simon continued to walk once the car man stepped into the street corner. For a few moments, Simon didn't realise that the man had stopped and continued on his way, till he turned to look. Simon stopped. What will you do now? He shouted out. The car man smiled, shouted back. I'll go home, probably. Where do you live? Simon called out. Far from here, the man shouted. Simon smiled, looking down. Will I see you again? The calm man smiled. You will do. One day. Simon smiled. Then continued along the road. As he walked towards the house, the calm man drifted away from the background. Simon stopped at the end of the driveway, turns back. There was a tear in his eye and he was starting to understand. What's your name? He screamed down the road. The calm man smiled again. My friends call me Ellis, he shouted. Simon began to cry. He understood. Does it get better? He screamed. The calm man took a moment. 
then replied, Only if you make it better. The calm man then waved and left. Simon's tears ran down his cheek. They approached the front door. He lifted his key to the lock and turned. On hearing the lock and the door shut, Simon's mother came down the stairs and entered the living room. Simon was still in the kitchen. Honey, what's wrong? his mother asked. I thought you were staying at Chris's tonight. What happened? Simon, through tears, smiled. Nothing's wrong. Everything's going to be okay. His mother looked confused. Oh, honey, of, of course things are going to be okay. Is something bothering you? Simon, looking at his mother, unloaded his thoughts. I didn't stay at Chris's. I went to a party and walked home alone from Kirby. His mother looked horrified, but on seeing her son's tears, she chose her words carefully. Honey, it was very silly to walk home on your own. Who knows what could have happened to you? You should have called. I would have picked you up. Simon knew he hadn't been alone, but couldn't explain this to him. His mum had been with him. I know that you need to make your own way in the world, but you will never be alone. Whether it's night or day, you ring me, you don't walk home alone. She went to the cupboard, and in the drawer she lifted out a bracelet. This will protect you. Treasure it. Let it be a reminder to be safe and make good decisions. She gives it to her son. Simon and his mother embrace in the kitchen. An unopened letter lay on the table. Addressed to Simon B. Ellis. Ben, the scene stood on the hill, admiring the same scenery. Ellis approaches, looking tired. The two stand next to each other. How did it go? Ben asks, interested. It was fine. If I remember, we should be talking with Mum around now. Ellis replies, smiling. The two smile. Do you think he knows? Ben asks. Ellis lifts his sleeve up and looks down at his wrist. An aged bracelet is visible. I think he does. Ben smiles and exposes the same bracelet on his. The two smile at one another and look out at the early morning. Five, The Friendly Neighbour A great many years ago, when I was a boy of seventeen, I made the rather foolish mistake of sleeping with the next door neighbour's wife. I can't deny I had considered the consequences, but had decided to take the risk, consequence be hanged. When eventually the husband discovered his wife's infidelity and the culprit, naturally he was very angry and made many a threat, suggesting some rather distasteful actions he would take upon my part. I could not deny that I had been a foolish young man. However, one evening, an opportunity had presented itself to me in the form of inebriation. In the madness of it all, I decided to visit the neighbour's house in the hopes of settling the issue. The husband answered, and angry though I knew he would be, and though I knew my attempt at trying to speak rationally with him might have been considered foolish. I then made the further foolish mistake of killing the man. Now, as my situation had escalated in severity, and perhaps due to my inebriated state, at the thought of discovering my mistake, and due to my inexperience of hiding bodies, my mind told me I should eat the man. Then I continued with my evening. 
For many years, the family next door searched for the man, and when it became apparent that they would not find him, they moved away, taking my infidelity mistake with them into the great unknown. There would be times where I would feel guilty for cutting the man down in his prime, and would consider a better option had one been available at the time. But as a foolish young man, I had done what many others have done before. I made a mistake. I will continue to live with that mistake and live with it alone, as I do not wish to give the family a heavier burden to carry. You may question why I'm telling you this, and don't be mistaken, I'm not using this as some act of redemption. I have been watching you for some time, and I'm confident you will keep this a secret.